It's a pleasure to meet with you through the internet to study God's word at this, this moment. May the Lord bless you as we study the promise of salvation from the Bible. I invite you to open your Bible in Matthew chapter 19, 23 to 26. We read, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then what, Christ, what did Christ say to them? Salvation, it is impossible for men to reach salvation by himself. But, it says, for men, this, this is impossible. But for God, all things are possible. What is our conclusion? Man cannot save himself. Only God can save him. Let us see how God works for the salvation of men. Christ made clear condition to enter into the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, he said, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, he shall in no case enter in the kingdom of heaven. Then Christ said, uh, the righteousness of the Pharisees, it, it's not enough. You need a, a superior righteousness to enter in the kingdom of heaven. And uh, Isaiah 26, verse 2, we find only righteous people will enter in the gates of the new Jerusalem. Then we read, open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keep the truth may enter in. Then here in Isaiah, God is talking about the uh, righteous people He's not talking just about one person, but he's talking about a people, a righteous people. But uh, in reality, what is our real condition? Isaiah 64, verse 6 said, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filth rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquity like the wind, have it taken us away. Now, in uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 to 20, we find a, a diagnosis of the condition of man. As it's written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understand. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under the, the lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known? There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law it is the knowledge of sin. Then, brethren, when we accept the truth, especially when we become reformers or Seventh-day Adventists, 
we try to obey God's law. But the law cannot save us. The law points out to our sin and our condemnation. The law is a, a means of detect our sin in our life. It's not for our salvation. Now, the only way to reach perfect righteousness is through faith. Let us continue reading Romans chapter 3 from verse 1 on. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Then uh, when we are tired to, to, to attempt to obey the law by ourselves, and we are disappointed, we are frustrated, then the Holy Spirit guides us to, to look to Jesus. Then uh, here the apostle used the expression, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Then uh, when we look to Christ on Calvary, then he developed in his life a perfect righteousness. He developed a perfect character. And he paid for our sins on the cross. Then when we look to him, we receive by faith his perfect righteousness. Now we are declared righteous. And the law itself, the law gives testimony that we are righteous now. Because we receive righteousness from the one who is the author of the law. Then we are considered righteous. Now verse 22 says, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe. Then uh, why do we receive righteousness from Christ? Because we believe on him. Believing means we trust in his perfect righteousness. Then this righteousness is imputed to us. It put, it's put in our account before God. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, verse 24 says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, brethren, I would like to call your attention for this expression here. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Then we are justified freely for free. Because we accept the grace of Christ. 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Here the Apostle Paul he repeats several times faith. 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 Justified by faith. Justified by grace. Freely justified. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believe in Jesus. Brethren, he's, he's a very interesting point. The justice of God demands that the sin should be destroyed because he commits sin. But at the same time, as we believe in Christ, God accepts us and he justifies us, he declares us righteous, and he makes make us, make us righteous. That at the same time, when uh, the God's law demands the death of the sinner, but why we are not destroyed, why are not killed by the God's, God's glory? Because Christ took our sins and he went to Calvary, and there he paid the price of our salvation. Then now, God executed his righteousness, his justice, punishing Christ in our stead. Now he can justify us. Then that's the reason why the Apostle Paul says, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him, 
which believes in Jesus. Then God preserves his righteousness, he preserves his justice, at the same time he can forgive us, he can justify us. Verse 27 says, where is the boast in them? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Then we find here the conclusion of the Apostle Paul about this point. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Then Paul make, made, make very clear that we are justified by faith without the works of the law. Now from Step to Christ, page 14, we read, None but the Son of God could accomplish our redemption, for only he who was in the bosom of the Father could declare him. Only he who knew the height and the depth of the love of God could make it manifest. Nothing less than the infinite sacrifice made by Christ in behalf of fallen men could express the Father's love to lost humanity. Uh, brethren, when we start the life of Christ, we see that the, his entire life was a life of love, of grace, of mercy. He, his, his total mission was working for the salvation of men. Then he was the perfect representative of God's character. Now, in Romans chapter 1, 16, 17, the Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul is talking, uh, uh, this expression, Jew and Greek, to refer to humanity, to class of people, people who had knowledge of God and people who had no knowledge about God. He used the expression Jew and Greek. For therein is the rightness of God revealed from face to face, as it's written, the just shall live by faith. Then, brethren, our acceptance, our justification, and our sanctification, our continuous Christian life depends on faith in Christ. Now, talking about the epistle of the Rome to the Romans, we find in Acts of the Apostle, page 373, 374. In his epistle to the Romans, Paul set forth the great principles of the gospel. He stated his position on the question which will agitate the Jewish and the Gentile churches and showed that the hopes of a promise which had once belonged especially to the Jews were now offered to the Gentiles also. With great clearness and power, the apostle presented the doctrine of justification by faith in Christ. He hoped that other church also might be helped by the instruction sent to the Christian at Rome. But how dimly could he foresee the far-reaching influence of his words? Through all the ages, the great truth of justification by faith has stood as a mighty beacon to guide the repentant sin into the way of life. It was this light that scattered the darkness which enveloped Luther's mind and reveal to him the power of the blood of Christ to cleanse from sin. The same light has guided thousands of sin-burdened souls to the true source of pardon and peace. For the epistles of the church at Rome, every Christian has reason to thank God. Now, brethren, then we already mentioned that we are justified by faith. Now, let us see what is the result of this justification. What's the fruits of this justification? As you go to Romans chapter 5, from verse 1 to verse 10. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then the first result that Paul presents here, verse 1, when we are justified by faith, we have peace with God. Our enmity, enmity against God was over. Now we have peace with God. Verse 2 says, By whom also we have access by faith in this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. 
Now Paul says that being justified by faith, we have peace of God and we have hope of salvation. He says, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Then a question, when God's glory will be manifested in the second come of Christ? Then those who accept justification by faith, they are prepared for the come of Christ, second come of Christ, because then we receive the glory of God. In verse 3, he says, not only so, but the glory in tribulation also. Then we receive power to face tribulations, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. We find hope again. And hope makes us not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commends his love toward us. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, a very interesting quotation from Ellen G. White. Grace is an attribute of God exercised toward undeserving human beings. Then, brethren, let us emphasize one point. God, Christ didn't come first time to save righteous people. He came, he came to save sinners. Then, talking about grace, it says, grace is an attribute of God exercised toward undeserving human beings. We did not seek for it, but it was sent in search for us. God rejoices to bestow his grace upon us, not because we are worthy, but because we are so utterly unworthy. Our only claim to his mercy is our great need. Brother, what's the argument that we can use to, to God to receive his grace? We are sinners. We are lost people. We, we need his mercy. We need his grace. The only argument, for instance, the tax collector, the publican, he, he presents a very short prayer. He said, oh God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. That was his prayer. What was our, our, the argument? You, you need to be merciful to me because I'm a sinner. That was all. The Lord God, through Jesus Christ, holds out his hand all the day long in invitation to the sinful and fallen. He will receive all. He welcomes all. It is his glory to pardon the chief of sinners. He will take the prey from the mighty. He will deliver the captive. He will pluck the brand from the burning. He will lower the golden chain of his mercy to the lowest depth of human wretchedness and lift up the debased soul contaminated with sin. Brethren, the, the glory of God is to save sinners, to receive those who are lost to be saved. Now, let us see the other result of the uh, grace of God. In Titus chapter 2, 11 to 14, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Then we can, we can declare that uh, grace is for all human beings, all humanity, teaching us that. Let us see the result of grace in our life. Deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope. Then, brethren, when we receive Christ as our Savior, we have a blessed hope to receive Jesus in his second coming. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that we, he might redeem us from all iniquity 
and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, in the same book, Titus chapter 3, verse 3 to 8, Paul presents here our condition before knowing Christ and our condition after knowing Christ. Let us, let us see. For we ourselves also are sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living malice, envy, hateful and hate one another. That's our, that was our condition before receiving God's grace. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared. Not by works of righteousness which he have done, but according to his mercy. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Lembra de here in Titus chapter 2, chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, he mentioned several times hope, hope, because we accept God's grace. We are, ju if we are justified by faith. Verse 8 says that this is a faithful thing, and these things are will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Now a question, or some questions. Do you feel that because you are a sinner, you cannot hope to receive a blessing from God? Do you, do you understand the question? Do you feel that because you are a sinner, you cannot hope to receive a blessing from God? Remember, that Christ came into the world to save sinners. Then we are sinners. Can we have hope? Sure, we can. We have nothing to recommend us to God. The plea that we may urge now and ever is our utterly helpless, helpless condition. Then uh, again, which argument can I use to ask for God's forgiveness, for God's acceptance? It is my utterly lost condition, which makes his demon power a necessity. Renouncing all self-dependence, we may look to the cross of Calvary and say, in my hand, no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. If you can't believe, all things are possible to him that believes. It is faith that connects us with heaven and brings us strength for coping with the powers of darkness. In Christ, God has provided means for subduing every evil trait and resisting every temptation, however strong. But many feel that they lack faith, and therefore they remain away from Christ. Let these souls, in their helpless unworthiness, cast themselves upon the mercy of their compassionate Savior. Look not to self, but to Christ. He who healed the sick and cast out demons when he walked among men is still the same mighty Redeemer. Then grasp his promises as leaves from the tree of life. Him that comes unto me in no wise, I will in no wise cast out. Brethren, here is a very wonderful promise. John 6, 37, Christ says, Him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. As you come to him, believe that he accepts you, because he has promised. You can never perish while you do this. Never. Now, brother, let's consider the experience of the thief on the cross. He was a lost sinner. He was a thief. He was condemned to the cross because of his sins. And he said to Jesus, O oh Lord, remember me when you come into thy kingdom. And immediately Christ gave the answer, 
I will declare to you today that uh, you will be with me in paradise. Why? That uh, thief, the repentant sinner, uh, he surrendered his life totally to Christ. He surrendered himself to Christ. And Christ promised to save him. Dear friend, this prom that we just read is for you individually and for me. If, you, if we recognize that we are a lost sinner and uh, we have no possibility of become righteous by ourselves, then we can go to Christ. And uh, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And uh, in Revelation chapter 3, Christ said, I am at, at the door and knock. If someone hear my voice and open the door, I will enter in your house. And I will sup with him and he with me. Then, brother, we have wonderful promises from God's word. Everyone who believes will be saved. The jailer in Philippi, he asked Paul and Silas, Men, what shall I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your house. Then uh, we have wonderful promise in the Bible that all those who recognize their lost and undeserving condition, they can go to Christ and Christ says, everyone who, that will come to me, in no way I will cast him out. May the Lord help so that this can be our experience today and ever. Amen.